Welcome. It's another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, who called us to live to a higher standard each day and not be satisfied with just a little empty religion in life. As the series continues in the coming weeks, we'll hear from many who were influenced by Elizabeth's life and message. Thanks for joining us. Today, we'll hear about a bombing, about praying and Yet, finding yourself in the rubble and pinned down about panic, confusion, and more. Also, we'll hear about a Chinese suitor, about sitting in a seat of honor, an unexpected convert, and a refusal to abandon her new friends. It's all part of the story of Gladys Aylward, parts five and six coming up of this ten-part series. Also joining us is Charleston friend Jean Hamilton, who knew Elizabeth and Lars. She'll talk about Christian service, school priorities, and more. And later on, we'll hear more about the Elizabeth Elliot exhibit as part of the Museum of the Bibles outreach there in Washington, D.C. Right now, though, let's get to part five. It's called The Village is Bombed. Continuing the story of Gladys Aylward. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend Elizabeth Elliot continuing my story of the small woman of China, Gladys Aylward, a very courageous, tiny little missionary whom I once heard speak back in 1960. We were talking yesterday about how she made friends with the Mandarin, the top official in the little village where she lived. And we were talking about child dealing. She had had a woman come up and offer to sell her a child for $2. And the Mandarin said, you just better forget all about it. It has nothing to do with you. But Mandarin, she said, now tell me what you have done in the district of Chaozong, he said. And so slowly, day after day, as they say, constant dripping wears away the stone, and she did manage to persuade him to her point of view at times. And she adopted a six-year-old boy whose name was Ninepence. And she adopted a boy of eight whose name was Les. And so here she found herself, the mother of two children. One spring morning in 1938, the Japanese began to bomb the area. Nine people were killed all at once in the street outside the inn that Gladys and her co-worker, Jeannie Lawson, had established. Gladys was praying in an upstairs room, and suddenly the floor tipped, and she ended up in the rubble below. A heavy beam pinned her for hours. She was not the only one that was injured. When she was finally released, she felt bruised and sick, but she dusted off her clothes and helped to pull out the cook and the others. All of them were suffering from cuts and bruises, but none seriously injured. The Japanese aircraft had gone, but now there was panic and confusion everywhere. One man was hopping from foot to foot. In the town it is dreadful, he was crying. Everywhere it is blocked. All are killed. It is dreadful, dreadful. We must go and see what we can do then, said Gladys grimly. Now stop that caterwauling and go and lend a hand. In her bedroom, she kept her medicine chest. It contained one large bottle of Lysol, one bottle of potassium permanganate crystals, a can of boric acid powder, and absorbent cotton, plenty of absorbent cotton. She rapidly tore her two bed sheets into bandage-sized strips and set off for the east gate. Nothing in her life had prepared her for the sight which confronted her. The walls and gate were untouched, but the center of the town appeared completely pulverized. Dead and dying, wounded and bomb-shocked, lay everywhere, for the streets had been crowded. The main street was littered with masonry. Bodies were half buried beneath it. People still trapped were screaming for help. For a second or two, she paused at the gate, quailing momentarily in the face of the task ahead. What could she do with her few silly bandages and the little bottle of permanganate? But the sense of futility passed in a second. To the chattering group of onlookers at the gate, she became authoritative. I need all of you, she snapped angrily. 
the surprised townsman stared at her, then obediently followed her instructions. Now get to work. You must all help. You two men clear that rubble over there. Someone is buried there. You three, go and get buckets of water, hot water. You, one, two, three, four, five, you'll clear the main street so that there's a free passage. All the dead you'll carry outside the gates. Understand? Now let's start working at once. Well, that gives you a little taste of the courage of Gladys Aylward and her absolute conviction that God had sent her there to do the work that he had for her to do. I do love missionary stories. How fortifying it is to our spiritual life when we study the lives of the saints of God through the ages. Just imagine a little London parlor maid becoming an authority in a Chinese village and getting the top official on her side. There was no question whatsoever that Jehovah God had called me to China. A little uneducated woman who put her absolute trust in the God of the universe, the creator of everything, from the atom to the unfathomably immense solar systems, he who calls us to put our trust wholeheartedly in him is calling you and me today. He sent his son, Jesus, to show us exactly how to do that. Luke 6, verse 40 says, A student is not above his teacher, but everyone who is fully trained will be like his teacher. That's a verse that I like to give to prospective missionaries or to young people that are planning to go on a missions trip for the summer, perhaps. Sometimes they will ask me for advice, and I say, just remember, a student is not above his teacher. Things are going to happen to you that you did not expect. Many things happened to Gladys Aylward, which were far beyond her wildest imaginings when she determined to go to China. And there will always be things which are bigger, more difficult, but ultimately more glorious. But our position is to be that of Christ. We are told to have his attitude. He who is God by nature made himself nothing. He became a slave by nature. A hymn which has meant a great deal to many missionaries through the years is we rest on thee, our shield and our defender. We go not forth alone against the foe, strong in his strength, safe in his keeping tender. We rest on thee, and in thy name we go. Yea, in thy name, O Captain of Salvation, in thy dear name all other names above. Jesus, our righteousness, our full salvation, our Prince of glory, and our King of love. Are there storms in your life today? For many of you, there are. Is it going to be an opportunity for stability and trust in God or collapse and despair? Gladys Aylward was tested over and over again, but her spiritual house was built on a rock. She trusted God for the supply of her physical needs, for money. As you remember, as a London parlor maid, she didn't have any money, but with two pounds and a few cents, she managed to get from England to China in a most miraculous way. She had to trust God daily for food, for shelter, for transportation, for dangers, for uncertainties, and fears. But the Lord says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. And if you'd like to look up one of my favorite verses in the whole Bible, look at Isaiah 41:10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Someone is listening who needs that assurance. I am with you. I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you. 
You need not collapse, in other words. And God save us from self-pity. There is, in Gladys Aylward, it seems, no self-pity at all. And there's nothing that more certainly will weaken our spiritual life than self-pity. It eats away at the foundations. Gladys Aylward was a true soldier, a soldier of the cross, prepared to do whatever God asked, no matter what the cost. And, yes, it costs. Do you remember the rich young man that came to Jesus and asked him what he needed to do to be saved? And Jesus said, well, keep the commandments. And he said, well, I've done that. What else must I do? And Jesus said, go and sell everything you have and then come and follow me. That price was too high for that young man. And the Bible says he went away sorrowful because he had great possessions. Many who call themselves Christians shrink when it comes to the cost of following Jesus Christ. Yes, they like going to church. Yes, they read their Bibles and pray. Yes, they call themselves Christians, and they like God, and they think Jesus was wonderful. But don't ask me to do anything that cuts across my human nature. The Gladys Aylward story illuminates the necessity of suffering. Are you willing to be like your teacher? Jesus was ruthlessly candid in giving his disciples previews of coming attractions. For example, in Luke 6, he said, you're going to be hated, cursed, mistreated, physically abused, robbed, and condemned. And he was saying, in effect, what else is new? To follow Christ is to engage in a desperate struggle against the prince of darkness. But victory is ours in Jesus Christ. Make me thy fuel. Are you willing to pray that? Make me thy fuel. Willing to burn out for Jesus Christ? That was the story of missionary Gladys Aylward, part five in our 10-part series. A little bit later, we'll hear about an unexpected convert and a refusal to abandon new friends. Also coming up, uh, we'll hear about the Elizabeth Elliot exhibit at the Museum of the Bible. Right now, though, former College of Charleston professor Jean Hamilton, a friend of Elizabeth and Lars, she'll talk about Christian service and school priorities. One of the things that she said to the students, now the first thing you're here for is to study and do a good job. And your Christian life, you know, is a part of that, but it's not to be your whole focus. I mean, you know, some of them will just go off and not study at all and do all the Christian things <laughs> with their <laughs> with their group. So that's one of the things that I first remember her saying to that group. I think of her, you know, so many times because I just remember her uh, encouraging us that when we go into a public restroom, we could leave it better than we found it. <laughs> Former Professor Jean Hamilton of Charleston. Thank you, Jean. Later on, Amy Van Dyke of the Museum of the Bible will join us. Right now, it's part six of the story of missionary Gladys Aylward. It's called A Chinese Suitor. Yes, an unexpected convert. Hear the story of that and more. Her name was Gladys Aylward. I told you the story of how I heard her speak at Prairie Bible Institute in Alberta, Canada. And I was wondering if she was going to be able to make herself heard, because back in those days they didn't happen to have a, a sound system, amplification. And I saw this tiny little lady up there on the platform. They had to put a box for her to stand on so that she could be seen over the podium. Well, I need not have worried about her voice, because the very first thing she said when she stood up was, I should like to read just one verse. And Jehovah God spoke to Abram, and he said, Get out! And Abram got out. Well, she jolly well got out, too. When God told her to go to China, Gladys Aylward 
packed her two suitcases. I think I said one last week, but that's not true. She actually did have two whole suitcases. A kettle and a saucepan were tied to the handle of one of them. And she got out. And she went to work in China with a woman named Jeannie Lawson, 74-year-old widow who was absolutely a no-nonsense, very courageous old lady. And their time together was rather short because Jeannie Lawson died. Gladys had declined to go for a walk with Jeannie one day because she wanted to study. And Jeannie was put out with her, and there was a rift between them. Well, Gladys went to another mission station for a short visit to let Jeannie cool off, and Jeannie followed after her, but was injured on the way and died not very long after that. Gladys developed a close friendship with the Mandarin, who had absolutely no idea how to treat her because there was no protocol for foreigners. A Mandarin knew exactly how to treat his subjects, but he was not sure how to treat this very strong-minded little lady from England. And one day he asked her to pull down the pagoda of the scorpion, and a huge feast followed. When the Mandarin's feast was held, Gladys, to her surprise, found that although, as usual, she was the only woman present, that had been her privilege for many years, On this occasion, she was sitting beside the Mandarin in the seat of honor at his right hand. This had never happened before. All the important personages of Yang Cheng were present. The governor of the prison, two wealthy merchants, several officials, about a dozen in all. The meal was simple. Unlike the sumptuous feasts she had enjoyed in early years and which had lasted for hours, toward the close, the Mandarin stood up and made his speech. He recalled how Ai Wei De, which was Gladys' name in Chinese, had first come to Yang Cheng, how she had worked for them, what she had done for the poor and the sick and the imprisoned, the new faith called Christianity, which she had brought with her, and which he had discussed with her many times. Gladys was puzzled by his references. He sounded so much like the chairman of a local committee back in England that she wondered if he were going to present her with an illuminated address or a silver teapot. But after speaking for some minutes, he turned very gravely toward her and said seriously, I would like to become a Christian. Around the table arose a murmur of astonishment. Gladys was so astounded that she could hardly speak. The guests nodded and smiled, and she knew that she was expected to reply. She got up and stuttered her surprise, her appreciation, and her thanks. The Mandarin saw her confusion and helped her out. We'll talk of all details later, Ai Wei Dei, he said. She sat down, realizing that she had made her most important convert since coming to China. One day a messenger came running. The Japanese had entered the Christian mission of Qin Shui, There were 200 refugees at the mission. Please come and help. Gladys already had a huge collection of slave girls, murderers, and convicts, and the Mandarin had not known whether to release them or to execute them. And she, not surprisingly, volunteered to take responsibility for all these slave girls, murderers, and convicts. The city had been bombed, Therefore, they could expect the enemy to follow up the bombing. Everyone must leave the town not later than the first light the next day. As she listened to the voice of this tall, thin figure in his mandarin robes, standing on the gray stone steps of the temple with pagoda roofs and the city wall framed behind him and the hot blue sky and the mountains beyond, Gladys realized how often, through the centuries, such a scene must have been enacted. The invaders invariably came from the north, bringing blood and death and destruction. The people fled to the mountains, then crept back again when the enemy had gone to bury their dead and rebuild their homes. Gladys then realized that God had fashioned them well, these mountain people. For her part, she would never abandon them, no matter what happened. In a letter sent home that year to her mother on a grubby scrap of paper, 
She wrote, Do not wish me out of this, or in any way seek to get me out, for I will not be got out while this trial is on. These are my people. God has given them to me, and I will live or die with them for him and his glory. The news that the small woman who possessed a god with magical powers of protection lived in the village had reached many people, and a constant stream of supplicants was the result. On the afternoon that the Japanese came, she was tending one of the sick women in an upstairs room. Even before her door banged open, she heard Wan Yu's shrill scream, They're here! They're here! Quickly she ran downstairs and across to the hole in the courtyard wall. She peered out. Theirs was the first house in the village. Only a small temple about 50 yards away lay farther down the valley. She could hear the priests blowing horns, banging drums, and offering up obeisances which were supposed to drive the Japanese away. As she watched, she saw a number of khaki-clad figures advance through the terraces and group near the temple. They talked among themselves. Some of them went toward the temple. Others started toward Wan Yu's house. Inevitably, the next place they entered would be this courtyard, unless she did something to prevent it. Hide yourselves quickly, she shouted to Wan Yu. I'll try to keep them out. She ran to the front gate. She did not know what to do. She only knew she must stop them, even to the extent of going out and fighting them with her bare hands. If she appeared by herself, perhaps the sight of a foreign devil in such an unusual place might occupy their attention for a time. Perhaps they would even forget about the others. The outside door was solid, the latch of heavy iron, and as she got to it, her courage ebbed away. She leaned against the door, turning so that her back was braced against it for support. Her clenched hand went to her heart to try to stop its pounding. For perhaps ten seconds she stood there, reaching with desperate mental agony for strength. Then, into the confusion of her mind, with the clarity of an articulate voice, came this phrase, My grace is sufficient for thee, because my strength is made perfect in weakness. She stood straight, and the feeling of panic seeped away. Then she turned, pressed down the latch, swung open the heavy door, and stepped out into the bright sunshine, abruptly aware of Wan Yu's piping voice from the balcony behind her. Awe de! They've turned back! They're going down the valley! They're going away! She felt the sunshine warm on her face. When she went inside, the old women were crying in relief. At another mission, she was knocked unconscious by a Japanese rifle butt. Colonel Linan of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek's intelligence service asked for help. Please take care, he said. Please take care. She was a week out in the mountain country, and when she got back, Linan was waiting for her. His relief was quite plain. But I've made these journeys a hundred times, protested Gladys. There's really nothing to worry about at all. That a young colonel of Chiang Kai-shek's intelligence should be bothered about someone as inconsequential as Gladys amused her. It was also very flattering. His visits became more and more regular. They became good friends. They were the same age. Both had eager, inquisitive minds. In the evening, they would often walk together through the narrow streets of Tsechou, past the dark bazaars hung with Chinese lanterns, past the fortune tellers and the storytellers, the food stalls and the silk merchant shops among the gossiping and laughing soldiers. He opened for her a new window on a country she had thought she already knew intimately, but which now she realized she knew hardly at all. Each time they met in the weeks that followed, the immense gulf between their separate worlds grew narrower. His voice fascinated her. One evening as he rose to leave, he bowed as usual, but his eyes in the soft lamplight held an awareness and intimacy that she had not seen before. She said good night abruptly. Was she attractive, she wondered? Was there still in her face and body the indefinable mystery that draws a man to a woman? And we will continue with our Gladys Aylward story tomorrow. That's called A Chinese Suitor, part six in our 10-part series on missionary Gladys Aylward. 
Well, before we go, let's uh, hear about the Elizabeth Elliot exhibit at the Museum of the Bible. It's a temporary exhibit. Here's lead curator Amy Van Dyke. So there's a number of things that we do at the museum with our collection. This particular exhibit is a temporary exhibit that will come down in January, in late January. So most of our temporary exhibits are like that. They'll run anywhere from three months to a year, sometimes longer. Um, But for the health of the artifacts, we rotate things in and out. We can't leave things up all the time because it's just as hard on the artifacts to be displayed that long. So we'll take Mm -hmm. these off display and we'll rotate in a different story in that area of the museum. But her collection and her artifacts are always going to be online. So we are working to post all of these objects online with descriptions. We link to the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation's website as well so that people can see what we have in our collection. So they're always open for research and viewing in that capacity. And then in the future, we will use parts of this collection for other rotations. So perhaps when we talk about translation in another part of the museum, we'll bring these back. Or if we want to tell a broader story about missions and mission work across the world, that's something that has been discussed at internally in our museum too, then these things would be brought back out. So it's a process of determining what's the best way to use these in the future, but they are definitely a valued part of our collection and will continue to be used in some capacity, yes. Lead curator at the Museum of the Bible, Amy Van Dyke. Well, our time together is coming to an end, but thanks for letting us come along with you. Maybe you are out getting some exercise or Maybe you're at home or at the office, wherever we found you today. Concerning a recent podcast, one listener said, Such an encouragement to learn about the old hymns of the faith. Kyla France, after listening to Bread, Not Stones, said, I was blessed and encouraged by this message. Well, thank you, and uh, friend, may you be encouraged and blessed by what you hear. And on behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org. More Gateway to Joy programs, devotionals, and more. elizabethelliot.org. Until next time, may God remind you daily, you are loved with an everlasting love. Underneath are what? Underneath are those everlasting arms. 